Hi, Jed from Cook Culture. I'm excited about this video that you're about to watch. We've edited it into two different videos. One is an hour and 47 minutes on YouTube, and then we've made a nice condensed one, and you're watching one of the two of those. Um, but Stephen Muscarella and I, um, and Stephen is from Field Cast Iron Skillets. He makes these skillets, and he is extremely knowledgeable in everything cast iron, has gone down the rabbit hole and farther to learn all about cast iron skillets. And I love cast iron, and I know a lot, and I've managed them a lot and I've seasoned tons of them and I've helped thousands of people buy cast iron skillets but they're still not everything that I know so I'm fascinated in talking to him and asked him some things in which I was hoping that that you may find interesting and things that I technically found really interesting so let's get into this it's a lot of fun I'm Stephen Muscarella I'm co-founder of Field Company um, and kind of call myself the pan man, uh, formally or unformally as, as it were. Um, so thanks so much for your time. Uh, I'm excited to talk shop with you. Um, I've read all there is about you and your company, but for those that are not familiar with Field, can you tell me a little bit about you and how you came to make one of the most coveted cast iron cookware brands in the world? <laughs> Oh, we're working. Exactly. I'm sorry. And does uh, it have something to do with your grandmother? Oh, yeah. Well, um, you know, I think the, uh, the Cliff Notes version is that uh, I, was, I have a bunch of, I was a maker beforehand, and I was doing a bunch of furniture, woodworking uh, things, and I ended up getting into some leather. And, um, and so I had a bunch of buddies that I was always hanging out with, and a lot of them were in really high quality tools. And cast iron was one of those things where, you know, when you're on a, you're on a trip with some friends and you stop by an antique shop and, you know, there's always a few pans in there to, to ogle and you can see which ones are amazing quality and which ones are, you know, kind of crap. And um, um, so I was sort of getting into that as well. And um, after, like literally months afterwards, my brother and I were, kitchen, or were cooking in the kitchen. We both um, were living in Brooklyn at the time. And um, he breaks out this, I don't know if I'm allowed to say lodge, but it was a lodge. And, uh, and he says, geez, what's wrong? This pan is not as nice as the ones that we were given by our, by our mom. And, um, and I said, yeah, you know, they just don't machine and polish them the way they used to. And um, he said, well, well, why don't we? And it was one of those, like, I think any business that ever starts always has that moment um, when you realize that it's for real. And, it was just so naturally like, yeah, we're going to do that. And I said, we could. So, um, <clears throat> and the connection to our grandmother is that um, these pans that we have are, there's a Griswold number 10. Uh, there's a, a Lodge three notch number seven. And my brother has the uh, Wagner number eight. And they're all, they all date from like the forties or fifties. And um, they were most likely wedding gifts to our grandparents. Um, and you know, obviously our grand, my grandparents were of that era where like, super embracing technology all the time. So by the time, you know, they probably scrapped them and ended up with some nonstick pans and my mom never really caught into them too much. So it ended up with us. And, um, so we ended up with our grandparents' pans and, and they're beautiful, awesome old vintage pans. And they kind of set this bar for cast iron that, Kit that wasn't really available at the time, so that's how we got our. That's how we got going. Right. Yeah, that's that's neat. You know, one moment in time just pivoted your life. That's fantastic. Yeah, um, I think we were we were both like looking for an opportunity at that moment too. You know, I think I was looking to do more than just be a craftsman, and my brother was looking to do something a little more tangible. He is sort of coming from the internet side so uh, it was really kind of a perfect perfect storm there for us both yeah and and do you think he had to come from Brooklyn for that sort of thing to happen um like was that know, an, like is it an incubator do you find there's people that are talking about that sort of thing all the time trying to like what's the next best thing to make that's really hip and cool definitely yeah de definitely New York City is a place where um people are always thinking about 
business like and and how to how to make things go like that okay um, and uh, a lot of creativity around that so um yeah i'd say that was definitely a definitely a help to be in the city cool cool yeah from from being the from the west coast our perspective you know i've been a, a fan and a follower of mast chocolate for a long long time yeah you know and that was one of the first ones that kind of introduced me to the brooklyn scene and then you know from there you know you see these little bits and pieces come out and just you know so much creativity it's fantastic so, yeah good on you um so to back up a little bit for those that may not be 100 percent sure of what cast iron cookware is um can you explain it and maybe compare it to other cookwares and and most people understand something like all clad you know a stainless steel cookware can you kind of put it in perspective of what what it all is and how it sits in the market yeah um cast iron is is there's like two main things that you that would probably you would classify as like defining that term that makes sense to the regular joe um one is that it's cast iron is like a type of iron it's saying it's a type of iron with two to four percent carbon and a bunch of other stuff like little bits of manganese and silicon phosphorus like stuff like that so it's literally just a classification of iron like cast iron wrought wrought, wrought iron stainless steels um you know it's basically calling it like this is cast iron this is a, this is a chemical this this chemical combination makes cast iron um the other thing <clears throat> is that it um cast iron also is referring to how it's made and and uh it's cast in a sand mold so um i always break this down like um basically a sand mold is something that is created at a foundry by pressing um sand together and you end up with like a cube of sand and if you were to open it up you would have you would see a pan like sort of carved out inside of it. And from there you pour the molten iron in there. And so, um, and the, the, the molten iron goes into the sand. It like instantly um, kind of turns the, uh, the sand into clay. So it holds its shape. And then, then you've got this cube with hot molten iron. And once that begins to solidify, you knock away all the sand and bam, you've got, you've got a pan basically. Yeah. And so that's casting. Um, and that's, so that's the way you guys make all your cookware. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, there's a bunch of other things that get cast. I think aluminum gets cast, bronze gets cast, um, cast iron gets cast. Um, and then there's ductile iron that gets cast. And, and that's all just saying, hey, we pour molten iron into a sand mold. And when we break the mold apart, we have the thing we wanted, more or less. That seems like a really laborious process. Why don't you just make a, a dye or a thing? Um, well, uh, it, in modern technology, it's not actually that laborious. Um, uh, we've developed this incredible technology where the sand is recycled throughout the foundry. It's poured down you know, from above and then these two machines just knock the sand together right in the shape that you want because you, you buy a tool that presses the sand just so in the shape of a pan in our, for example. <laughs> and, um, and then it kind of just spits it all out toward the end to, so the point, to the point where like at the end, you basically have your casting and then you got to clean it up and make it nice from there. Um, so it's actually, <clears throat> if you, you know, and this will, we'll get into this when we talk about the difference between um, cast iron that's not super nice versus uh, nicer stuff. Yeah. Um, you no. Know, basically, it just spits it out, and all you got to do is grind off a couple pieces, and you've got, you've got what like ninety nine percent of the cast iron in the world is right then and there. Okay. So, um, and then I don't know to, to 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 position it with stainless steel. I think the coolest thing about cast iron, from my perspective, as a differentiator, is um, it's got a couple things going for it. One is that it forms a coating, a natural coating, when cooking with it. And um, that coating is called seasoning, and that is basically what gives you this nonstick property. And that's completely natural and doesn't require any chemicals or anything crazy. Um, and that's a huge benefit for a lot of things. Um, and then I guess another big, uh, big deal is that you can 
kind of use it on every uh, heat source. You can cook on, on your stovetop, you can throw it in your oven. There's no like glue or joint things that you have to worry about. Um, you know, you can put it over a fire. So it kind of works everywhere. Um, also works on induction, which I believe you have to have a sp special stainless steel to work there. Um, um, and so, and then the other, the other side of that uh, is that the, um, you know, it's, it's sort of reactive. It's a natural metal. And uh, one of my, one of my colleagues um, over at Brooklyn Copper Cookware um, has a great bit on, on um, cooking with like real metal as opposed to um, stuff that's not really uh, sort of meant for, I don't know, sort of not, not engineered out of it. I guess I'm probably boggling that. So go to his website, he'll tell you all about it. But um, it's basically, it's a natural, it's a natural metal that's been around for thousands of years. Yeah, and it's Bro Brooklyn Copper Kitchen? Uh, Brooklyn Copper Cookware. And you Copper just read it this Cookware. night and it's just, it's incredible informational. Okay. He calls it pure metal cooking, I think is what he calls it. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. No. Great. Okay. Um, so you talked about foundry and does, does that mean that everything that you make is hundred percent American made? Yep. So from raw materials and the sand you talked about and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, all the iron comes from either like some small percentage is raw pig iron and then most foundries um, source all their uh, steel from um, recycled <clears throat> scrap yards in huge okay. quantities. So if you walk into most foundries, you'll just see a pile of engines and brake rotors and, you know, things like that. And uh, that all gets melted down and they have extremely tight controls on, on the metallurgy because it has a, a huge impact on the quality of the casting you get. So they kind yeah. of melt it all and keep in what they want and take out what they don't want. And so is there then different grades of that metal that you can use? Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, I assume you guys choose the best quality metal you can get. Well, we choose, we choose the metal that you need for cast iron and, you know, because we're machining the pans, we're trying to choose something there. So, you know, I think, um, one of the, one of the main things you can do with, um, we have, we use gray cast iron, which is what all cast iron ever is pretty much made out of. And um, you can choose how hard you want it to be. And in the world of cookware, like being hard doesn't matter. Like, <laughs> okay, you know, uh, um, the lowest hardness is nice because it's easier to machine. So going harder doesn't actually get you anything except for a more laborious process, and uh, you know doesn't really have any benefit. So, and what makes it softer? Um, just whatever you add to it. Um, you know, it's, it's classified as like, we use gray 30 iron. And, uh, and if you just, if you tweak your, your inoculants, which are those, those small ingredients like silicone and manganese and phosphorus, if you tweak those ever so slightly or, or the carbon itself, that's how you, um, <clears throat> uh, you can adjust your, your end product. Okay. Um, yeah, no, that, that's fascinating. You know, breaking it down into the different materials that are in cast iron is something, you know, at the, at the retail point of sale, it's, it's not something that we, we talk about, you know, we talk about just cast iron. Oh, it's, it's just 100% pure cast iron. Right. Um, <laughs> and uh, so it would be interesting. I, I, maybe we'll come back to some of those elements in a little bit because I think that that's interesting because we talk a lot about what's in cookware in, in our retail stores. Um, well, you know, if, I, if you want to go a little deeper, I could talk to you about um, Poland, which was, that was where we sort of got into that. Um, yeah, I know. I read a little bit of that. So yeah, please. This is great. Yeah. So, I mean, basically when we first started out, it was like, Hey, we really want to make a pan. We're calling up foundries and they're just telling us they're laughing at us, telling us no, or telling, telling them, you know, saying, Oh, we could do it for a hundred dollars. And, and I'm like, geez, that's so, that's just doesn't sound right. And, um, and so when we, when we stumbled upon our Polish professor that we reached out to Martin, um, you know, he's like, yeah, we can do that. We just got to figure out what the right, you know, combination of metallurgy is to do it. And so that's what I ended up doing is flying over to Poland and spending a week with him. And we've made a bunch of sand molds and we were trying to get really smooth surface finish. <clears throat> and, um, and yeah, when it came to the melting day, you know, we're throwing the iron in, we're throwing, 
the, the, the carbon, all that stuff. And then, and then there's this little packet of ingredients called inoculants. And those are all like the specially, you know, his, his like scientific formulation for how do, how do I make a thin casting, you know, that it's going to flow really well through the mold and make it and, you know, be successful. So. Great. So, so on that point, this is one of those, those critical points of what makes a field pen so unique. Is it not that, that you've made something lighter than, than most? Uh, not, not, not in the metallurgy necessarily, but yeah, the pans are by, well, by, by treating, making sure we have pure, really good iron underneath, uh, we're able to machine it really well. So, okay. Um, but what, what in there is what makes like when you pick up one of your pans compared to a, a, a lodge pan, you know, it seems like a lighter pan. Yeah, and, it is. Yeah. And, and, in in there somewhere in that scientific experiment with that professor is that where you were able to find that solution to the lightness to the quality um no i would actually say it might even be the opposite because at that point we might have been trying to avoid machining the pan and just make the casting okay. itself really thin yeah and um and when we came back to america and we wanted to use the green sand casting process instead of some of the more expensive ones like uh, investment casting or wax casting. Um, um, you know, basically we, could, we, we couldn't get a foundry that could make it thin. And so what we ended up needing to do was find a, a, a foundry that would make it thick. But um, when we put it through the machine shop and cut away all that material, what was underneath was really high quality. Okay. Um, so we took, we take away the weight, you know, we, we actually cast a eight and a half pound pan and then we take away four to four and a half pounds during machining process. Wow. And that's, and if you were to try to do that with a lodge pan, you would blow up your machine because the pan would crack apart or you just, you'd hit all sorts of hard, um, hard spots in the iron and that would chip all the, the cutting tools and you just, you couldn't do it. So great. Okay. Yeah. No, that, I, I know that uh, we're going to get into the differences between uh, high quality and low quality casts in a bit. Uh, and I look forward to that because that, that kind of a geeky way interests me more than animals, anything. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so the number eight, the first pen that you guys made, yeah. this pen actually came from your original Kickstarter campaign. Oh, cool. Yeah. It's got this meat one. on it. Pardon me? You got the wheat? The wheat? A little wheat mark next to field company. On the back side? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally. Sorry. I, and I was looking at the logo. But yes, the little wheat. Um, yeah. yeah. So I don't know if anybody can see how close. There you go. That's it. Yeah, right there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that came from the original, which is my pride and joy. I just absolutely love this band. Great. Um, and it blows my mind how well this pan works. And that's why, you know, it, it's, it's so interesting to me to have this conversation with you today because, you know, I've been selling cookware for a long, long time and I've used a lot of cookware, but I'm still not hundred percent sure why I love your pan so much. <laughs> so that's why like in the, the technical geeky part, that's why I ask you and, you know, when you're standing with this professor, like I want to uncover that, you know, like why when I've used you know, the highest of quality cookware in the world, I've used, you know, French made two and a half mil copper. I've used all different types of old antique casts. You know, I, I've used, you know, from, from high quality to Meyer to, to all clad to all the other brands. And this one performs so incredibly well for me. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, uh, hopefully I will become enlightened by the end of the conversation. So I appreciate your time on this. Okay. Um, so the number eight was the, what you, you started with. Um, what, what do you make now? What's the, what's the width of the, of the lines? Um, well, we, if you look at my background here, look at yep. that. Okay. Yep. Yeah. See the, uh, the, uh, that's the number four right there. Yeah. And then the six and then the eight. Yeah. And then the 10. Yeah. And then the 12. Okay. So, yep. so we basically make everything from a one egg pan to, um, about the biggest pan that you would want to handle with a with a with one hand um that would also that would kind of fit on a regular that would fit on a big a fairly big burner so okay the, the number 12 is uh 13 and 3 eighths across at the top yeah um 
So, okay. Very nice and, little lineup. Your number eight is still the backbone? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a close, it's a close uh, tie between um, the eight, I think, believe, I believe the eight nudges out the 10 just a little bit. Those are the, okay. those are kind of the two big, big ones that people want um, on a, you know, I think, especially in like a first customer um, scenario. And then when people come back, they're usually looking for, um, you know, one or the other sizes. Okay. And just to clear the confusion, so number eight actually means in size. Yeah, so that's uh, that was our the thing that we had to call. We had to make this call <laughs> in the design phase where we want you know do we want to make this do we want to do this throwback to vintage pans right? So if you ever if you go shopping around and find vintage pans, they all have numbers on them, okay. and uh, the numbers roughly correspond to um i don't know i'd say the closest thing that number corresponds to is the inside cooking surface of the pan okay but um really what that was was um that was a way for different manufacturers to indicate um how the pans would fit in with their stoves so the lids on the stove that you would you take your if you had a wood burning stove you take the lid off and you take your number eight cover off for your number eight pan um, so there was a little bit of a matching thing going on there. Okay. And, um, and, and so more or less, if you, if you kind of do some research, you see that there's, there's some, uh, loose, but there's some loose standards around like what a number eight is. I think the, the smallest number eight I've ever measured across is a little bit over 10 inches on the top diameter. Mm -hmm. And the bigger one, the biggest one is probably 10 and five eighths. Um, okay. so we, we went with 10 and a quarter, um, cause we were also just being really cognizant of hitting that, that weight that we wanted to hit. Yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned something that, that comes up a fair amount, um, and the retail side of things, uh, lids that fit pans. And it seems that mostly lids and American skillets are not really a thing, but was there a time? Um, yeah, I mean, when you flip through those old cast iron cookbooks, um, or like the vintage book cookbooks, there's one by David, there's David Smith has a Griswold and Wagner and a Wagner and Griswold, um, book. And it kind of shows you the history and what, what they should cost if you see them vintage. And, um, yeah, I mean, lids are, lids are, are there, I guess, uh, they, they don't really, um, they didn't really, they don't really last as long, I guess, or maybe people drop them more or something because right. obviously not as prevalent. Um, have you had a thought about making lids for your pants? We have one underway. <laughs> okay. For the number eight. And as soon as we get one, one done that we like, we'll probably be, we'll have to make a call on how many we, we fill out, whether we fill out the whole line or just, you know, kind of keep chugging away a little bit at a time. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, we've, we've heard the lids. <laughs> yeah. We've heard people want the lids and we we're going to make a nice, a really nice lid for the pan. Awesome. Yeah. Cause it's interesting. My, the, the, the number eight that I have a seven quart stove lid for an oven fits perfectly. Yeah. I think that's kind of the crazy thing is, um, because we use that, it's almost like because we use that uh, old, um, sizing system, um, it's not, impossible to find lids that fit yeah you know that as, as is um you know and then hopefully when we make ours people will want that one because not only will is it going to fit perfectly it's also going to be the most attractive thing you could put on top of your pan yeah it's, you know coming from us essentially good point yeah because you can buy a universal lid that can fit many different pans but they're not the most attractive right yeah um so Again, a, a kind of rudimentary basic question. Um, so somebody who's looking to buy a new cast iron, you know, now we have a good understanding of what cast iron is, um, but what are the elements? Like when you design them, when you're like, okay, I wanna make the best cast iron skillet in the world, what are the, what are the elements for the perfect skillet? Um, I, so I, I wrote some notes on that, which I feel like I wanted to, well, first of all, 
the short answer for us was it needs to be lighter, smoother, better handling, and they got to look good. You know, they got to look good. They got to look timeless. And you want to reach for them over and over again. That's kind of like the key to making a really quality object for us. Um, to give a little bit longer answer, I'd kind of compare some of that, some of the, the cheaper stuff to, and, and kind of talk about what's going on there and why you wouldn't, why you might want to spend a little extra money and get it right. Um, and so basically like the most available cast iron is not that expensive because it's been cost engineered in manufacturing to get it to be as cheap as possible. And that's, that means like trying to get rid of as much humor, human interaction into this object and eliminating non-essential steps. And so that, that'll give you a, a rough, heavy, kind of uninspiring object with what I call a candy coating seasoning, which is kind of that shiny um, <clears throat> dark seasoning that you see with a lot of these pans. Um, and that, which also that kind of flakes off eventually because it's not really the right way to season a pan. Um, and so I don't know when you take when you take all of that when you take all that human uh, interaction out, you end up with something that has no soul really, um, or less soul. I mean, I think the great most cast iron it's hard to take the soul out of cast iron, but there's a way to do it with more care. And um, so that's where you know where we where we come from, <clears throat> which is you know for for right when our cat right when our castings come out of the foundry we're inspecting them for defects that would be not acceptable uh, not only are we grinding off some of the bigger pieces of chunks of metal that are attached we're also taking them to a belt sander and having a you know a human being is touching that up and um, making that nice and then from there, we're gonna to go to our machine shop. And like I said, it's gonna start off, we have pretty heavy casting, but then we're gonna cut out all that weight. And uh, we did a lot of testing to see <clears throat> what was a good weight for the pan in terms of cooking performance, but also in terms of um, a weight that you would just, that, that didn't really register as this is a heavy thing that I don't really wanna pick up. You know, It needs to be something that you can just reach for and not, and not mind that. Um, or just not think twice about it really. Um, the other thing that we get with our machining process is we're able to create <clears throat> an extremely flat cooking surface. And um, that, you know, obviously that's a huge benefit for, for heating up and flat and even, you know, even thickness all across. Like we're not, we don't have big thick chunks here and there. It's like, so the pan, even though cast iron doesn't heat that evenly as a, as a, as a rule, if you keep it even, it's going to heat a lot better. Um, so we get it nice and flat. Um, and then I think a big part of what we do is we get our seasoning right. And you can see in our, in these pictures, like our pans are dark when they, when they got, they arrived to you, they're not, they're not super dark, but they're dark because we've, we've gone, through a seasoning process where we are really focusing on getting our oil into the cast iron as opposed to on top of it, which is why, you know, which is what I would differentiate from the like the candy coated type seasoning, which um, is really thick, but doesn't, is not super well bonded to the iron. And so we take a, we do a lot of work to make sure we get it in to the pan um, and, and getting, build up on top is sort of in the user's court from there. So, um, and I'd also say that again, and I think we kind of touched on this a little bit is <clears throat> from a non-technical standpoint is um, we just have this, we have this notion that these old pans, like they just look good. They're, they're, they're something that you just appreciate. Um, and so we wanted to make an object like that too, that you would want to leave on your stove um, and proudly display. And, um, and you know, it's like having, it's like the reason babies are cute, right? Like you got to take care of them, right? So that if they were atrocious looking, you would want to take care of them. It's kind of the same way with the cast iron pan. You know, you want to put more 
love into something that uh, that kind of inspires you in that way. Yeah, it's interesting. My my field never goes in the drawer. Yeah, always sits on my stovetop. It's always waiting for me. Yeah, that's where we want it. <laughs> <laughs> so we we touched, or you just touched on a on a few things in there, but I, I wanted to just kind of be a little bit more particular. Um, when I'm using my field skillet, I find that it's more nonstick than other brands of cast iron that I've used. Uh, I maintain it the same way, but like all my, all my cast iron, I maintain the same way, but for, for some reason, field becomes even more nonstick. Why is mm. that? Um, I wish I could give you a definite answer here, but I would say again, if I, if I, I would go back to my, our seasoning process and the way we treat our surface <clears throat> and we have, we've really gone to great lengths to try to create a, uh, a pan surface that will accept seasoning, but still be, but still hit that smoothness factor. And that is actually a pretty delicate line to draw. Um, so if you've been using any of the other modern uh, cast iron manufacturers um, that make a smooth surface, uh, you'll notice that they have like this copper seasoning and, um, you know, basically the, if your pan's not getting black, you're not really building up seasoning. So, so, so just to be clear, we're, we're, we're talking about which brands that if we're talking uh, apples, uh, apples to apples. Oh, losing you a little bit there. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Which, which brand particularly are you, are you thinking about when you compete when comparing field to something else in the market? Um, I would compare our, I would, com I would say that our competitors, uh, Smithy, Finex and, um, Stargazer have not, um, not figured out how to get their seasoning to stick to their pans very well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, I would, uh, I would second you on that. It's, um, you know, I of course have tried all of those brands that are, are doing great things. I, I got an appreciation for what they're doing. Um, but you know, from, from our perspective, carrying field pans and no other pan of that sort of quality because I, I wasn't able to get the, the satisfaction um, personally. Um, you know, I, I've been stunned by how nonstick your pan is. You know, I, I love the look of it. And I love the simplicity of it. It's just such a, a timeless design. Um, but really when it comes down to it, you know, I, I don't want my customers to be struggling uh, with right. a nonstick coating. And I find that, you know, right out of the gate, you know, this thing's been just absolutely amazing. So that's why I asked you in, in that technical way. And, you know, I, I, I get it. You don't have one magic answer for me, but um, it is stunning how quickly it becomes. Well, you know, it's, I would say like, yeah, obviously we take extra care to get our pre-seasoning right. <clears throat> and that's what I'm talking about when I talk about getting our seasoning into the pan, like that's going to get you off to a really good start. Mm -hmm. um, and it will give you things for your, for your seasoning that you're developing to bind, bond down to nicely um, a lot faster than, than, um, than a, a pan that's actually too smooth, essentially. Or if a pan's rough, I think what ends up happening is there's, um, there's feedback you get there, which is like, this is rough. Rough things stick, right? Mm -hmm. that's a, and that's, a, that's, like, um, that's just like a common sense feeling. Um, I think if you, if you were to put a crap load of oil on your pan, you could get that rough thing not to stick, but yeah. simply that, that feedback in the design is going to make you believe that it sticks and you're basically going to create that result because yeah. of that. So, and you, you're mostly talking about like a lodge cast iron type rough pan. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Okay. Um, so, you know, your belief of what you've got really does actually <laughs> play into that. Um, we don't talk about that too much because people will go, woo, give us the woo woo. But, nice. uh, <laughs> but it's true. You know, if you think what you think is going to happen, you, uh, you can manifest there. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. True. <laughs> um, so you've mentioned the, the three ply coatings. Um, what like is the coating? Um, and why does the coating help with the nonstick? Um, so, um, yeah, so I don't know if I call it ply. We, 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 we put three coats, three coats of grapeseed oil on the pans. Okay. Um, yeah, grapeseed oil is what you use. Yeah, we use grapeseed oil. Yeah. And just uh, straight grapeseeds, like go to the store, buy some grapeseed oil. Uh, yep. Pretty much. Okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, 
that's all you need. <laughs> okay. The, um, I guess I wanted to step back because I think this is one of those questions where I can go directly into a technical answer, but really I need to kind of do a little, a little uh, 101. Um, okay. So yeah, our, our pans come pre-seasoned with the three coats of grapeseed oil. Um, and that seasoning is, uh, is like, a, it's the buildup of a coating that forms a barrier between your food and the raw iron. Um, and the better you get that barrier, the less sticking you're going to have. Um, so if we were not to do that, your pan would come to you silver, um, in color and you'd have to do it yourself somehow. Um, but, but the way we, the way we go through it in our, in our, uh, in our factory, we, we got some tricks that up our sleeve that you can, you couldn't really do at home. So, okay. Uh, so we're, we're making sure that we get it, you know, Get you get you a pan that's ready to use right out of the box with that with those three coats. And why three? Um, well, it's kind of like the mo it's it's like the minimum effective dose to be honest. <laughs> okay. So you know the first coat is considered more of a primer coat, and that's all about building up a layer that really is well bonded to the iron, and then. You know, and you have another coat that goes on. It's just an additional, and then a, the third coat is is something we do to try to make it to give it that aesthetic, um, a little bit of shine that you want, and, um, and and a little bit more protection. You know, for th we're throwing these things in a box and then putting them in a warehouse, so they need to be able to kind of survive some elements. Um, so three is if we if 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 we eliminated one of those coats, we'd probably end up with a, a little bit more brown of a pan. And we're not, we're trying to get, trying to get you going a little bit than that. Okay. And, and you think four, four is the responsibility of the owner? Pretty much. Cause at a, at a certain point, like you want, you can't get great seasoning by baking it on an oven. All, all the great seasoning that you end up developing your can, in your pan is really the pro, is through cooking and your maintenance and care that you put yeah. into it. And do you, like, is it comparing field or, or any high, high quality cast iron to um, Teflon, you know, and, and Teflon is, is a huge part of the conversation that we're having with people all the time and we have for years. Um, and you know, I, I I've come to to my own conclusion. But do you feel that you could take, you know, an eight inch skillet and make it as good as any Teflon pan? Um, you can. I mean, I I I cook scrambled eggs in my pan, and I don't have any problem. I don't have any sticking or anything. It's um, um, you know, Teflon is designed to um, kind of be idiot proof. And I think one of my hopes with people getting into cast iron is they like take a little bit more accountability and a little more interest in their tool and what they're trying to create and learn a little bit about how it works. And if you do that, which basically comes down to like understanding the amount of heat you need and the amount of fat you would use, like uh, you can get that performance. Um, and it's just, so yeah, I'd say there really, in my opinion, is, is there's really no place for Teflon when, by the, by the time you get through all the chemicals that are going into it, which are going to come into your food. And, um, and the fact that once that coating wears off, you've got something going into a landfill, you know, it's like, I don't know, man, like one YouTube video where I can show you like, keep your temperature low and slow, use a bunch of butter and here's how you make scrambled eggs. Like, and, and by the way, this pan lasts forever. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, okay. Well, I, I think we're fairly aligned on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so something that uh, I, I know you've, you've got a little bit of a, of a cloak of secrecy around this one, but uh, as best as you possibly can, but, you know, and I've read about your journey with this one, but I, I'm, I'm fascinated because when like one of the things that I noticed and people notice all the time, when you, when you grab 
a fuel pan or touch it. And, you know, we have them in our stores and people touch the pan. They're blown away by the texture, the, the smoothness and that, that wonderful baby bum feel of the inside of your pans. You know, the outside has a little bit of texture, but the inside is just absolutely like, like smoothly polished glass. And how does that happen? Um, so the machining process is basically where we, where we get most of that smoothness to come from. And um, so that's, um, you know, we're cutting away iron at a very, very slow rate. And by doing that, we just, we create a, a practically smooth pan in that step. Um, and I would say, so like 95% of our smoothness is, is happening right there. Um, uh, we also put the pan through a, uh, a vibratory tumble, which um, will smooth out that, make make that softer as well on the inside and the outside. Uh, Sorry, can you say what that was again? A uh, vibratory tumble is a... Uh, <laughs> okay, yeah, sorry. I, I thought I didn't understand what you said. It's a machine <laughs> that's shaking and it's got a bunch of... Um, it's got a bunch of um, like ceramic media and it's a little bit wet and you throw a pan in there for 30 to 60 minutes and it comes out uh, with sort of anything that was sharp sort of blunted down and okay. nice smooth. So. so it's like, 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 like a rock washing type thing? Basically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Like, you know how all the, when you go to a, a river or a stream, all the rocks are round. Yeah. 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 That's kind of what I was thinking in my head. That's okay. Idea. Yeah. That's, that's fascinating. I didn't know you went through that step. Yeah. And I had read at one point in time that you get, you would try to CNC machine and then failed. Um, well, you, uh, um, that you, you had found that the CNC process had created too much sticking or something like that. I'm trying to ring a bell. Um, okay. I'm trying to think about. I, I think that this that what you're what you're thinking about there is going back to the like making something too smooth. Okay. <laughs> and so you can mach you can control the the surface finish that you get in machining. Uh, you could make it um, rougher or smoother just based on how fast you cut it. Um, so we, and we've chosen specifically what a, a rate, a feed rate it's called that, that produces a texture that we really want. Um, and, um, so, um, I think if I would go back to saying, if you, if you create, if you go through a machine shop and you, um, go too smooth, then you end up with problems like that, um, where you, you just can't. You can't get that seasoning into the pan very well, right? Because you have no tech, no texture. Exactly. Okay. So, and I learned that the hard way over and over again through, you know, I think in the in the early days in 2014 when I was just trying to restore cast iron pans, and at first, you know, as a woodworker, my initial instinct was to sand them. Right. I would so I'd sand all these pans, nice and silver. And nice and smooth and uh and then i put them in the oven to try to season them again they come out copper and it's like what the heck right um you know they're too smooth and, and everything's flaking off yeah yeah if it's if it's too smooth it's really hard to, to rent flaking i don't know I, i've i've not developed a, a seasoning on a pan that's too smooth okay yeah yeah you know i understand yeah i, I we since sometimes have that problem with um with mineral b with the debayer or dubaye uh, mineral B, you know, cause it's a, it's a carbon steel pan that's being hydraulically pressed into shape and it's got a beautifully smooth finish to it. But um, once in a while you have one that just chronically flakes. Yeah. I think there's um, kind of like a majority of carbon steel. I don't ever, is not going to probably take a great seasoning. Um, yeah. I, yeah. I find that, that, you know, a good one, there's a mineral can, uh, the mat for pens, you know, they can season pretty nicely. Um, but they, you know, I have talked to the guys at, uh, at Dubois and they spend a huge amount of time figuring out that, that before they're hydraulically pressed, how they finish the, the carbon steel. Um, mm. it, it, it's same with you, you know, they obsess over it. So, yeah. um, so, um, 
the, we talked a little bit about nonstick and I think, you know, people could probably get a sense already of what you and I feel about nonstick. However, that egg pan, that one pan that people want, you know, like, do you feel that there's a place for that in somebody's kitchen where they're just like, Oh, like they, that one fried egg that I have to make for my husband, you know, or, or wife or however it works in the household. Um, and nothing works as well as, you know, this, whatever scan pan or, you know, this, something I bought at Kmart or whatever. Um, you know, do you think there's a, a, a good argument to say like, no, you really can get rid of that and make one of these just as good? Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Knew that was coming. Yeah. But what, I guess in that, so absolutely. So that was definitely the answer, but how, like, how in that, in that egg pan, that thing that is just absolutely glass, what's, what's the trick to that? Like if you were to have a pan that you were going to keep as your egg pan, like what would be that absolute trick? Um, if you want an egg pan for ca a cast iron egg pan, you just don't overheat it, you know, keep, keep the temperature low and, and put a little bit of butter in there and, and that's, you're not going to have sticking eggs. That's okay. So, it's all user. It's all user error. Um, okay. uh, you know, in my opinion, if, would you, would you say to have like a number four or something like that and just keep it for eggs, like have that one aside, season it a certain way and just clean it and keep it isolated. Or would you, um, would you say that it, uh, could be, Can you take a break? <laughs> Sorry. That's my, uh, my son making breakfast. Oh, good. Um, egg pan? <laughs> yeah, no, he's making soda stream. Couldn't be more loud in the kitchen. Uh, <laughs> so, um, sorry. My, my point was, do you think it's best to have an isolated pan for eggs or, or do you think it's a, you know, that's not the point of what you're trying to make is to have, you know, a pan for this and a pan for that. Do you think everything should be made, um, uh, to be used for whatever you're, you're, you're cooking? Um, no, I, I think everyone's, everyone's like personal cuisine is super personal. Um, if you're an everyday egg person, sure. I haven't have an egg pan. I would, I would go with the six personally. Okay. If, uh, um, I don't really actually eat that many eggs. Um, so, you know, I don't, I wouldn't think to keep a pan as my egg pan, but, um, um, you know, if I was cooking a lot of fish, for example, I might want to keep a pan kind of in that category so that anything I didn't have to worry, you know, I don't want to probably bake a pie on, on my fish pan. Right. Necessarily, Cause there is definitely going to be some flavor things. And there's something to be said, you know, if you can, um, if you can afford to have a, an egg pan, uh, yeah. If you can, you know, making sure that you're not cooking stuff that makes it harder to cook your eggs the next day. I can see that. Um, again, I think, you know, there's ways to overcome that and, and, and that just become, that's just getting more familiar with your tool and, and your stove and, and your process. So in that you touched on, you know, things that you don't want to cook in there for your egg pan. What would be something that you would cook in your pan that could um, lessen the quality of the nonstick? I mean, anything that has like a caramelization or sugary type thing, if, if, you could end up with a little bit of residue in there. Um, if you, if, um, um, I guess it depends what you're trying to do. I mean, I know, I know for me, for example, if I try to cook, uh, if I try to fry a bunch of bacon in my, in a pan and then just flop eggs right into it, you know, yeah. you end up with that, you end up with some caramelized stuff and, um, that doesn't necessarily lead to the easiest egg cooking scenario. Okay. Um, so you would suggest giving it a clean or a, a good wipe out before you'd move into your eggs. If you're, if you're concerned about, yeah, if you're concerned about all that, or if yeah. you don't mind, if you don't care, then that's fine too. Just right. do it at the end, you know? <laughs> right. To how particular you are. I, uh, you know, I think, I think with cast iron, you kind of, there's a spectrum. There's people who are, only care about their food product and they use the tool because that's what they want to use to get there. And then there's people who 
are all the way on the other end of the spectrum, which is it's all about using the cast iron and the food is sort of a, um, you know, a byproduct. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, and, I'm with you. Kind of figuring out where you where you land in that spectrum is is uh, is maybe kind of important to determine yeah. whether you need an egg pan or whether you're just a one pan dude that or or girl that. <laughs> right. Just uh, everything in the one pan. Yep. Yeah. So uh, we touched on a little bit of of fats, um, but you know, using fat and also not using fat, you know, some people like to cook with less fat and that's a big, big question mark around cooking with cast iron. Um, you know, how do you approach those two things? Like when you're cooking with fat, what's the best type of fat to use? And if you're trying to lose less fat, like, can you be successful? Um, so I would say that like, I, I don't use any fat when I cook pancakes. I don't have a problem. So there's no, there's no sticking problems there. Um, Do you have fat in your pancake batter? Yeah, probably some butter, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess, I guess I'm going to have to say that I'm not a great person to ask how to cook with no fat because I like cooking with a lot of fat. <laughs> I don't have a lot of experience trying to, trying to cook cast iron uh, with minimal fat, but I, as far as I understand, I, I, I mean, unless you're boiling water, I don't really know what you're trying to cook in a frying pan without using any fat. So, yeah. I mean, you don't have well, like, to eat. say taking something that's quite like got a lot of moisture. So say that you're going to, you know, like cook down some onions, you yeah. know, and onions are going to produce, or maybe even peppers or mushrooms, for instance. I, I would never do any of that without fat myself. But. <laughs> okay, fair. <laughs> but I would. Fair. I, don't, I don't think it would be a problem. <laughs> yeah. Okay, fair. Well, maybe that's something that I'll be doing as an experiment for yeah, yeah for another let post. Know, yeah, let me know how it goes. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, and, and in that, for, you know, all cooking, do you think there's anything that cast iron isn't good for? Um, <clears throat> you know, traditionally, the things that are that you, you avoid acidic food when you're getting going. Um, so so only, make, only at the beginning of the seasoning process avoid acidic food. Yeah, you know, I've um, I've I've, I've been able to do everything in my pan once I got a nice seasoning going. Um, really, I pretty much deglaze after every meat protein I cook now. And um, okay. I still don't know if I'd let a huge uh, batch of tomato sauce simmer for hours on end. But, okay. um, you know, once you've got a nice seasoning, it pretty much, it's pretty much going to hold up. Awesome. And what do you deglaze with? Lemon. What's that? What do you deglaze with? Yeah, either some sort of vinegar or wine, or um, sometimes uh, some lemon. Okay. Um, that's generally what I end up using. Okay. So we talked a little bit about this earlier, um, but the big difference, you know, if somebody's going shopping for a, a piece of cast iron, you know, they're like, yeah, okay, I have cast iron. I know I want cast. I, you know, my grandparents use cast and I, I need to get there. Um, you know, there's a pretty wide spectrum from, you know, Field being a top end brand uh, and a premium price. Um, but you can get into something for <laughs> pretty cheap if you want to go to the hardware store. So, yeah. you know, what is that? What does that mean? Um, I, yeah, I think we kind of touched on this stuff. It just, it just, you're just not going to get the experience that you're talking about with your pan. You know, it's going to be something that it's just another object in your house and you use it when you need it and you put it in the cupboard or otherwise, and it's going to feel bad in your hands. Most more than likely it's going to be super heavy. Um, seasoning will likely fail um and um you know it just it just won't have a personality or, or anything to it okay so uh, how about like I, and i understand that from from talking about low end to high end but what about like a medium price product to to a to a field what what do you think the is there a a, a massive end use benefit or is it more the love affair and the journey 
I don't know, what is a medium medium use? Are we talking like fifteen dollar Chinese casting? No, Maybe say say I, say like um, you know, like Lodge has now come out with a product called Black Lock. Right, sure. Yeah. Right? You know, and they're 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 pricing that in the middle. It's not a lodge and it's not a field. It's kind of it's right in between there. Yeah. So, you know, from a black lock product to a to a field product, you know, if if as a consumer, you know, why would you choose a piece of lodge over a piece of black lock? You mean a, a field over a black lock? Sorry, is that what I said? Yeah, sorry. Why would you choose a field pan over a black lock pan? Yes, thank you. Um, because <clears throat> they still got, they still didn't get it right <laughs> if, <laughs> <laughs> you know they still, fair yeah they, they yeah and, not, and i guess to, to make that point to anybody that's you know listening to this is that the the inner part of the pan in a black lock is the same as a traditional lodge pan so yeah i, I my opinion is what they didn't get right is that they didn't go to that next step on the interior machining um but you know they they've improved the, the the coating and they've improved some of the lightness and so on and so forth. Um, but do you think that they're, you're going to have the same failures with a pan like that as you would with a cheap pan? Yeah, I I actually think that there's that that seasoning is is nerve wracking to me. I think they've they've just doubled down on that candy coating and um, and that's just going to fail massively eventually. Mm -hmm. um, because the problem they just they've just really put a thick coating on and that coating is bonded to itself more than it's bonded to the pan sure and that's why i call it this candy coating and so the minute something gets underneath that you get that you're going to have some flaking issues for sure mm -hmm. um the other thing i feel like they got wrong is like great you took the weight out but um it still feels like hell in your hand because they uh they did this little like you know funny teardrop weavy thing and um you know you can't get your hand up near the base of the pan so you know if you have a heavy object right here and you're holding it there that versus out here you know this feels super heavy because it's just simple leverage you know yeah yeah and their handles just like totally blew it in my mind on that too so you know yep. and that's just one of those tiny little details that affects whether you reach for it every day or not because right. if it's if it feels bad in your hand, you're not, you don't want, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to be getting this positive association with it. Okay. But what about the end result as the, as the food slides out of the pan? Do you think there is, you know, a, what's the spread of quality in that, you know, the finished quality you think between the two? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's still, it's still a rough pan. So you're still not going to, you're not going to experience that gliding kind of ice skater, ice skating rink. Smoothness and yeah, and again, just sort of reference point of this is a rough surface. Food sticks to it. Fair. So you had mentioned like so here I've got the the field number eight, and this is the um, the handle that you talk about that is so wonderfully designed. It's very comfortable in the hand. Um, the only thing that you know as makes sense, this is an iron handle. It gets hot. Um, what's, what's the plan in the future for having something that stops uh, or, or some sort of a handle helper or some sort of a, a sleeve? Yeah, we, we have, we've had a leather sleeve for the pants uh, for quite a while now. They sell like, they sell great people love them. And, um, you know, if, if you're, uh, mostly stove top cooking, you just leave it right on there. Um, okay. So you had, so you have sleeves for them. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, That's fine. I thought I figured since you had the uh, the car, the chainmail that you would have the leather sleeve. You should... <laughs> I, I don't. I don't have your guys' sleeve, so that's something that um, we should definitely talk about. Yeah, you should get them. They're yeah. they're, they're attractive and they're useful. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Yeah. No, we definitely will. Um, so we talked about you know high quality, low quality. Does it matter if the cast iron is made in China? It mattered to us. <laughs> yeah. uh, it mattered to us from a, just an overall feeling of, of, uh, of heritage. Uh, this is an American made product. It's got a, a deep history here. Um, and I don't know how you can 
I don't know how you can uh, avoid. I don't know how you can uh, be true to that heritage and make it in China. Okay. Um, um, the other thing is, I have all these Chinese pans that people are making, even the ones that are trying to do it well. And uh, there's something about them you can just tell that they're made in China. <laughs> you know, they're just. It's just so, like. They're, they're, is it a design something. thing? Like, what are they missing? What's the mark they're missing? Yeah, a design and a finish, and you know, I think uh, little mistakes in the processing that you can find that are you know things that um, if your supply chain is six months or you know some ungodly distance away from you, so you can't be there watching all the time, or you can't be communicating in your in your English language, you know, like. There's so many little things that happen at a foundry that can affect the quality of what you're making. Mm. And so to, to have that chasm between you um, is like, I don't, you know, you just, just doesn't, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen on, on, a, on a quality, on a quality level. Um, I think that there's maybe also some things things around like you know we don't really we don't really know what their foundries are like who's working in their foundries um or i i don't know i'm sure it's fine honestly like it's 2020 china has been coming around so but um you know i walk i go to my foundry a couple times a year and i see what's going on i meet the people and um that was important to me um so yeah, it does matter that it's made in the United States. Yeah. Okay. Cast iron's heavy. That's the single largest issue around talking to somebody about cast iron. Um, is that something that you guys continue to work on and how did we get away from the heaviness? Um, I feel like we did as good a job as, as as we should, you should do with cast iron. Like if, if, if our pans, we, we hit about the number eight, we hit, we average about 4.33 pounds on our number eight. And um, we really, that is specifically the weight that we wanted to get cooking performance that we want out of the pan, but also to be something that doesn't really feel that heavy to you in, in the end. Um, we found that after about five pounds is where people start to go, damn, this thing's heavy. <laughs> yeah. um, you need even lighter than that, then I think either you gotta go with a smaller cast iron <laughs> yeah. or, um, or you have to go to probably a different kind of cookware. Um, I know carbon steel definitely can benefit from that, but mm -hmm. uh, neither carbon steel nor cast iron, once you go too thin, is gonna have great cooking performance unless you've got a a really nice stove <laughs> right okay so <laughs> to, what you're uh, saying is to get the quality yeah. of cooking you have to have the weight yeah yeah okay yeah that's what i end up telling looking people in the face and tell them the same thing yeah it's a uh, it sometimes is a hard hard conversation but they have to get over it <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i mean the same the, the you get pretty bad cooking performance out of an aluminum pan that you put on the stove and burn everything with because it goes gets hot so fast you know mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. So in, in cooking and, and the, the performance of cooking, so a lot of time, like see, you know, buying a field pan, getting it out of the box, they look gorgeous. They're ready to go. You know, with a little bit of, of cleaning just to, you know, if it's, it's being manhandled and uh, before you start cooking with it, but you're ready to go. Um, you talked about caramelization and creating stickiness, you know, in the maintenance of the pan, you know, the day-to-day -day use and all the different things that we're going to cook in that pan, you know, how do you keep the thing in such beautiful shape? Like how, what's the best way to maintain the pan on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, yeah, I have a, I've recently, in the last year I've, I've been playing around with chain mail and cause I had a couple hunches and it's turned out to be, I think the absolute winner when it comes to developing seasoning on your, uh, on your field pan, as well as cleaning it up. Um, so, cause what I found is <clears throat> the chain mail kind of knocks anything that's stuck on, it kind of knocks it down from the top 
instead of kind of picking it up from underneath and chunking off the pan. Mm -hmm. So you're able to sort of wear, wear down anything that's stuck on into the pan a little bit more. Okay. And so and when you're talking about chain mail, you're talking about something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Something. Yeah. Okay. So that's a chain mail scrubby with a piece of silicone on the inside. Yeah. Okay. And does field have a chain mail scrubby? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We, it... I, I, I found a uh, company that makes them here in the United States with United States steel and um, on, you know, they get nice closed loops and I liked the size of the loop specifically for my pans. Okay. And uh, uh, I, I, I did experiment with the silicone insert stuff and I just found that I just really just like the, the rag itself, just the, the straight square of it. Okay, great. And that's a field product that we can get from you, yeah? Yep. Great. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah I, I find the, the application of, of the chain mail on the surface is just absolutely stunning. It's just truly yeah. bizarre how it polishes as you clean. And I can do exactly. anything. I can have any sort of mess. Even sometimes if I, you know, don't get a little bit of water to soak right after I cook and it's really truly baked on, you know, the chain mail just, yeah, yeah it's, it's stunning. Yeah. I mean, so, I think that the, the, great, the great thing about the chain mail is you don't really need to remove everything. If you blend it all, if you kind of blend it or feather it all in, into the pan more or less, yep. that's fine, you know? And then, um, I don't know the secret, the, the real secret there though, that to me is, um, that polishing that you're talking about, you're, you're basically, you're kind of, you're semi scraping the pan just a, a tiny bit. Mm -hmm. And again, like I said, texture, you want a little bit of texture for that seasoning to hold on to. Yeah. And yeah, by fair, doing yeah. that every day, you know, by doing that every day, you're, you're really setting yourself up for success. Yeah, no, it's, it's stunning. I end up, I, I hold it and put my fingers over the edge and then I use the, my, the, my fingers to feel the pan, you know, as I'm bringing that polish around. And then once I yeah. feel like I've got like any of the chunks off, then I, I you know, it's, it's good and ready to go. Um, so once, once I've done that in the sink, running water, no soap, um, what do I do with the pan then? Dry it on the stove, put it on some heat, dry it out and, uh, and then put a coat of oil on it. I, uh, we were actually also developing, <clears throat> um, a seasoning product for that, which is kind of like the ideal thing to use. Um, so a magical and, and, combination uh, of magical things. Yeah. You know, super magical awesome. <laughs> little beeswax, little, little sunflower oil and a little, uh, and grapeseed oil, of course. Okay. And, and why would you add sunflower? What, what's sunflower? Why not just straight up grapeseed? Um, we are trying to balance the chemical composition uh, with also just like the cost of ingredients. And, um, for this product, we wanted to go high end and make it all out of really nice cold pressed organic oils. And so, uh, if we used only grapeseed oil, we'd, you, you know, it would be an outrageously expensive product. And, um, okay. and so I was able to dive a little deeper into, um, the, the chemistry of the oils that make the best seasoning. And I was, I found that, uh, sunflower seed oil is actually just about the same as grapeseed oil and uh, okay. and it's a little and a little bit more cost effective to to find so um and i didn't you know i actually <laughs> i did a, a a full experiment with it to make sure that we were going to be there creating what we want to create uh which involves setting up a camera in a dark room with the exact same lighting set up with flashing and so i could kind of do before and after on pans after I'd season them and not. So yep. kind of got a pretty definitive. There. Awesome. Um, so, and, and did, you create, did you create that video? Uh, it's not a video, but I do have a, I can show you um, a, a whole slideshow of sort of before and after photos. <laughs> awesome. That'd be great. I'd love that. So Something you mentioned, I'm planning, sorry, I'm, I'm planning on, doing that for like a, a taking a new pan and um and uh showing the process of developing seasoning mm -hmm. because you know like you can 
everyone's always saying, look how good my seasoning is. And they're holding it in the light just so, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, let's do one where, let's do one where every, there's no change. Everything has been held constant except whatever seasoning has built up on your pan. Okay. I look forward to that. Yeah. You mentioned beeswax. Why beeswax in there? Uh, a few, few reasons. Um, beeswax um, preserves the oil and the oil, the best oil for seasoning is a little bit unstable when it is around oxygen. It kind of wants to go quickly. It's like the same characteristics that make it great for seasoning also make it want to go rancid quickly and the beeswax stabilizes that. Um, it also helps um, it solidifies the product so that you can kind of get the right amount, you know, onto the pan without getting too crazy. And, um, yeah, you know, it'll, it'll say solid. Ours, ours are going to stay solid at 120 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's going to be a solid thing. You can, and you don't have to worry about spilling it. It'll just be sort of a nice tin container somewhere on your, uh, in your stove area. Um, and, uh, it also, it also adds a little viscosity for the application so that you can get a nice even coat there cool okay and how far away is that product we're hoping for june okay great it's coming down the pipeline fairly soon yeah we'll see if this crazy climate allows it the uh we just got word that our the, the sticker mule is not producing stickers <laughs> if you're <laughs> for non-essential <laughs> non-essential objects so um you know that would be a funny I just that's just the, those are the those are the cards you get dealt. I guess when things are weird. So, but we'll yeah. see. Yeah, and and how how much how big are they going to come? Like how much do, when you buy with this product, what's going to look like? Uh, where do I have those cans? Um, it'll be a two ounce, two or three ounce container. Tin. Okay. So a little. This tin. is not you know something like this. It'll be a little bigger than than this. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. like a one. Yeah. Awesome. Well, look, definitely look forward to that. Um, so we touched on, on oil. Uh, grapeseed oil is what you recommend on a daily seasoning if you're using just a straight oil. Yeah. For, for straight up seasoning, grapeseed's great. Yeah. Um, and that's for, yeah. for, sorry, oven and stovetop method. Yep. The, uh, the sunflower oil we get is actually not that easily available because it comes in two different types. Uh, you can get it in high linoleic uh, version, which is the type you need for seasoning. But uh, what I think actually what you see at stores is high oleic. I don't know if I'm pronouncing those words right. I've never actually, okay. I've never actually uh, tried to hear them out loud properly. I should <laughs> just read them before. <laughs> uh, basically, uh, that. That's all me just saying, if you're just looking for a single oil, grapeseed oil is pretty great. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would say, um, yeah, for the seasoning. I don't, I, I think maybe this segue into the other question you wanted to ask, which is, um, I don't really cook with grapeseed oil that much though. I really, I know we, we talked about trying not to cook with fat at all, which I don't yeah. do. But when I cook, I try to cook with saturated fats because I believe that that's, for me, that's that, the science is there to okay. support that and the flavors and the flavors there um, as well. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, saturated fats don't season terribly well. Um, yeah. They stay, they stay kind of gummy and oily. Uh, no, they don't get gummy and oily actually. They, uh, they uh, don't form bonds with each other, mm. and that's what they're, and that's what the polyunsaturated fats, which is a grapeseed oil, crosslinks with itself. Okay, and what about using something like an olive oil or avocado oil? Yeah, um, I, the monounsaturated fats. So, so I kind of like that's when I talk about fat, saturated fat, oil, butter, ghee, lard, coconut oil. Monounsaturated fats are like your olive oil, avocado oil, um, sort of the traditional ones you hear about. And then the polyunsaturated fats would be your vegetable oils and, and, and most seed oils tend to have that profile. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, I I love Italian cuisine and the cook of good amount of it, and olive oil is what you use. And I think one one thing I use for just a standard in terms of health and cooking and flavor is like if it's been used for a really really a long time and they're healthy people in that <laughs> culture and i think it's okay yeah but what do you think for the optimal seasoning of, of what like what's going to create the best most successful seasoning that go to the grape seed i'll do that right yeah okay um for for cast iron cooking people that are learning how to cast iron cook what do you think the best way to learn the methods of cast iron cooking where, where, where would you point somebody to um their grandmothers <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh you know we have a good amount of uh material on our website okay uh, on fieldcompany.com in the journal section okay um and we also provide some recipes that we are sort of like layups in terms of getting you going yep um I think uh, there's some Facebook groups that are kind of fun. That um, if you can get through the, the, the weird folks and, and focus on the, the good ones, the fun ones, then that's great. Um, right. We're so I guess I guess there's a, there's a good point to make there for people that are are interested in cast iron and start to kind of poke around looking for information. There's some people that are fairly obsessive about cast iron online, and is that a resource or is that something to kind of ignore people that are? I think, I think the thing to ignore is that um, there really isn't any one way to, to do it right. I, I, t I have prescriptive techniques that I, I stand by and believe in and think are probably about the best thing I've, I've come across, but that's, it's also a specific to the way I cook, what I cook, what my stove is, what utensils I'm using, all this stuff. So um, the peop you just got to watch out for anyone who thinks that there, there's only one way to do something because that's just not true. Um, right, okay. Um, and those people are just obnoxious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good point. So I guess what, what I, to, to help people that are listening to this understand that is that you will see in the comments section of a lot of people that are doing good work to help teach you how to season. You'll have people that will be like, no, 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 absolutely not. There's no way that that's going to work. That's all bad. It's all wrong. And really, really harshly negative. And it's, and it, it can throw people sideways because they're like, Oh, well, I thought I was doing it right. Now all of a sudden I'm not. Um, and, uh, so I, 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 I would support that is that, you know, if, if somebody is, getting something successfully done and it's working stick with it right yeah yes yeah. yeah you know the the I, I i still think of these pans as tools and so you've got to everyone has a probably a unique relationship to their tool and there are certain principles that you need that like the better you adhere to them the better your results but um just like anything there are some principles that you can ignore or fudge a little bit from time to time and still do just fine so right um, if I, I was going to say, um, that, uh, Jeff Rogers has a lot of good stuff, culinary mm -hmm. fanatic. I feel like he, he has a pretty nice level head and kind of yeah. talks you through some stuff nicely. So, yeah, yeah, that's a great recommendation. Good on you. Yeah. Um, so in your journey, which seems like such a fascinating journey to me, um, what, what's, one or some of the most surprising things that you've learned in starting, you know, a, a world-class cookery company. Um, I, I actually, I wrote down for this, but, I, and I think I stand by this. Um, I think one of the most surprising things to me was that we needed just about every nickel of that 1.6 million we raised on Kickstarter. <laughs> Right. So can, can you tell me just a little bit what you mean by the 1.6 million first to put it in perspective? Yeah. So we, to, to kick off field company, we'd spent about a year developing our ideas, our designs and learning as much as we could. And eventually we decided that like the best way to see if we had a business that made 
that actually could hold water was to launch a Kickstarter campaign and see how we could see how many of these things we could sell and see what, see what happened. And, um, so we went about and made a nice little campaign and, um, and quickly on it started getting a lot of good traction and, uh, and that's where, that's where this came from. Like, yeah, exactly. And so, so, you know, I think we, we kind of had a, a thought that we were, well, we really only needed $30,000 to get the tooling to start this thing going. And so we figured that would be a good amount to, to, to sort of ask for as a minimum amount. So that was the goal. The original goal was 30,000. You asked. The original goal was just, yeah, let's get 30 grand so we can at least keep going with this project, you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, internally we were like, well, hopefully we can beat Finex, which did like 200,000. So right. <laughs> we were kind of yeah, like, yeah. Oh, hopefully we can do that. <laughs> and, um, uh, yeah, but then it just sort of catapulted off on us and we ended up with a pretty viral campaign. Yeah. Uh, ended up on the front page of Yahoo and, uh, yeah. So long story short, we sold 15,000 pans and raised $1.6 million. Yeah. And, um, and then we really had to get to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it took, what was it, a, about a year, I think? I, I can't remember how long I waited now. It, it, you know, it seemed like an eternity then because I wanted the pan so bad. I know, yeah. Well, it <laughs> took us, uh, yeah. We had, we, our first foundry was a fiasco, so we had to find a second foundry. And then, you know, I spent eight months in the Midwest um, learning as, engineering documents and everything I could do to get the quality where I wanted it to. And, um, you know, in the end, in retrospect, I'm actually really proud that we, I believe we got uh, all of our pans from that Kickstarter done within a year okay. of, our, of our Kickstarter. Yeah. Good on you. Yeah. Which, uh, yeah, I, I think we were, we were, we were a little more bullish that we were going to be faster, but I think, uh, reality has set in and, yeah. and the, and the and the and the thing that we set out to do was not to create a mediocre pan it was to create you know an heirloom um quality object and um yeah. and that not only took time but lots of money <laughs> <laughs> well i i i think you have you know that the pan is just absolutely spectacular you guys were awesome in your communication during the time of you know when you paid your money down and got the pan. There were several updates along the way, um, you know, and you guys showed your, your commitment and your professionalism. So I, I, I appreciated it. Cool. Yeah. Um, so we talked a little bit about, about new items. Um, we talked about, uh, you know, the, the, well, the, the sleeve that's not new, but uh, the chain mail scrubby and the, and the oil and, a, and a, or the beeswax and the lid that's coming. Uh, but anything else that you've got in on the workbench? Well, you know, it'd be funny to make lids without Dutch oven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was hoping you were going to say that. <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, yeah, so we're working on those in tandem. Okay, know. great. And what, what kind of sizes are you looking at? Uh, well, what, uh, you know, with all this, with anything new, we always have to kind of go through a pretty intensive engineering phase. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're starting off with a number eight Dutch oven. Okay. It'll be four and a half. No, is it four and a half quarts? Yeah, four and a half quarts. Perfect. Um, it's really, I'm really pleased with it. It's a very pretty object that we've managed to create. And um, uh, yeah, so there's going to be some challenges on the machining step there that we're going to have to overcome and uh, probably end up going back to the drawing boards for other sizes to make sure that we incorporate everything we learn from there mm -hmm. into the next sizes. Okay. And what kind of time frame are we looking at for that? Oh boy. It's always a crapshoot. I mean, <laughs> but it's sometime in 2020. Ideally. <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair. And uh, w when do you think we get to see a sneak peek of the product? Well, there's a good chance we're going to want to pre-sale it. Um, okay. Uh, because, frankly, we don't really know how many lids people are going to want. You know, there's, at, as of today, there's close to 50,000 number eight pans, number eight field skillets in the universe. Yeah. So, um, you know, the difference between 1% of people who want lids and 2% yes. is the size of the pool there. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so we'll probably, I don't know, 
I haven't confirmed any of that yet, but yeah. And and with the oven, do you have a, a prototype? Not an iron, just a plastic one. Okay. Uh, we were going to make some iron prototypes, but then this uh, virus thing came along mm. and changed some timelines that made that not make sense. So great. We're just Able. going for it. Things are underway, and yep. um, you know we've got a fun fun bit of engineering ahead. It'll be even fun more fun if I can't visit the places. Yeah, to yeah. Do it. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know. Well, any, we're, well anything we're gonna that keep, you we're, we're gonna keep track of. <laughs> awesome. Anything you can share with us in some uh, in look and design? You know, we, we we're hungry for some information. <laughs> okay. Um. So. Feel and Co. If somebody wanted to get more understanding of what you do and what you guys are all about, where where do people go? Um, our you know again our website's pretty good. We're basically in a, a modern sort of internet company, which you know maybe maybe one day we'll have some more stores. But for the most part, we're we're on the internet and uh, yeah. So we've got our website, we've got an Instagram account, and um, and if you want to go see what it was like five years, four years ago, you can go look at our Kickstarter. And cool. All that yeah, information I, is still pretty valid. And yeah, I, I, I try to point people towards that all the time. It's pretty interesting, you know, watching that journey with you guys. It's still kind of sitting there frozen in time. It's, it's yeah, it's cool. kind of fun. I, I, I reread it like a year ago, and I was like, you know, all this is still 100% true, and you know, really nice. And we didn't, we didn't drag on too much. You know, you, you can read Kickstarters that look like they're, uh, you know, a, this, this thick book or something. Ours is yeah. just like, boom, 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 boom. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's fantastic. Um, and so we're the only Canadian retailer of the field product and you guys are, are quite selective of who you sell in, in retail. How many retailers do you have in North America? Oh, well, last I checked, we're somewhere between 25 and 40 total. Yeah. And you guys have people coming to you all the time wanting to be a retailer? Yeah, we have a nice little inflow. I think, um, you know, we, we, we haven't um, explored that avenue as much. And obviously in this current climate, it's yet another thing not to, that's kind of back, back burnered. Um, yeah, yeah. But, but what, what, how do you choose a retailer? Like what, what, how do you choose a partner, a retail partner? Um, well, we love the mom and pop stores. We love someone like you that can tell a story, be involved in what's going on, has an opinion about things, um, and curates, uh, an experience for their, for their customers. Yeah. Um, and we're not as interested in being, on the back shelf next to all this other stuff and, you know, kind of being treated as like a price commodity, um, mm -hmm. as much. Um, you so know, you're not going to find field at target anytime soon. No, we don't want to, you not really, that doesn't do it for us. You know, it's like, yeah, it kind of cheapens what we're after too in some ways. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. And I think for, for all the retailers you work with, it would probably feel the same way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we're, we're incredibly honored to, to carry your product and to, to, to show it to people. People come from, they come out of the woodwork, you know, people that don't even know us, you know, they, they find the product and they come and they're just obsessed with the pan, uh, you know, and, and we run out of number eight to number tens before anything else. And people are just like, you know, they're so sad that they've made this pilgrimage into the store. <laughs> we don't have uh, the product. Yeah. So we're constantly, uh, you know, making sure we're, we're getting more of your guys' product because it's, it's, it's fantastic and it, it sells very well for us. People love, love the product. Yeah, was, I, was, uh, sorry. I would have to give you a lot of props for that. You know, I think you, you've really been a great um, supporter of ours and appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Well, it's, it's fun. I, I really enjoy it. You know, but uh, something that made me really excited was last Christmas because we started carrying the entire line, I think, kind of mid-fall, late fall last year in 2019 the amount of Christmas presents that were being bought from husband to wife of a field, you know, number 10 or, or a number eight was, it was stunning. You know, that was the thing like, Oh, this is what my husband wants. He just wants these three pans. It's all he wants for Christmas. <laughs> 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 it's like, you know, and these are like, you know, 60 year old guys, right. That all they want is a field by pan. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that it, it definitely showed me that there's, you know, I, I'm convinced, but I'm, you know, I'm not always picking winners when I'm, I'm, 
partnering with, with suppliers. Um, but when people were coming and so emotionally bought in to a field pan, it really showed me, Hey, you know, this is a pan. People are seeing what I see, you know, and they can really associate with it. And so I, as a, from a retailing perspective, they are a joy to sell because people love them so much. They're so emotionally invested into them. So I appreciate all of your insight because, you know, I want people to be ultimately successful. You know, the last thing I want is somebody to buy a pan of one of your pans and not be happy with it. Right. right. And, and as you pointed it, it, it is always user error. And so, you know, if you are somebody that's listening and you, you're not being successful with it, it's on you, but please reach out, <laughs> <laughs> reach out to us um, because it, there, there is a way that it, it, you can be successful. Um, you know, I found, and I touched on it a couple of times when we talked about a lot of times people are using olive oil to cook with. And I find olive oil is actually the thing that people are the least successful with because it just does not solidify. And it's constantly creating stickiness and gumminess. And so I, I try to push people right away from fruit oil altogether and just towards seed oil and simplify that conversation. Seed oil to cook to season and fruit oil to finish. And I find from a retail perspective, from people trying to simplistically understand at a, at a retail level, <clears throat> that's the easiest conversation to have, right? Cause I find the nuance of in there, it gets confusing. Right. And so yeah. it's like, yeah, use grape seed to, to cook with, grape seed to season, and drizzle your olive oil after the fact, or drink it out of the bottle, however you want it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, that's just always the challenge is uh, in a retail setting, you, you're kind of on the hook for being prescriptive. Um, yeah, very but much so. If you want to teach someone something, you kind of, you need to go back to principles. Yeah. Um, I think uh, our, our goal in having the chain mail and the brush and the, uh, seasoning oil um, products is really to <clears throat> we're not trying to say this is the only way but we're going to say if you want to if you want to come under our protective wing this is this is it right here you go this is this is what we do yep um, and, that, and that's something that we've always wanted to do from the beginning as well which is you know sure there's there's people who already like cast iron and there's there's all these other folks that you can just get them over that hump you know yep. You could really show them something, get them something special into their life, basically. Cool. And I agree with you. It is a hump. I find there's that aha moment when people finally get how to season. You know, you can struggle, struggle, struggle. And then it's the one thing that they're not getting right. You know, the heat's not right. The oil's not right. Something's just not right. And once they get that right, then, you know, off the races. And they're so incredibly happy. Yeah. Right. Um. So you know, that, that covers a lot of our technical questions, so I really appreciate it. And then something that I, I, I wanted to, to, to talk to you about from kind of a uh, you know, personal perspective. Um, you know, we've talked about coding, and we've talked, we touched a little bit on Teflon. Uh, but you know, the, the relationship in the world of cast iron and Teflon, it's a little bit of, of you know, it, it, and I may simplify this, but a little bit of good and evil. Um, we all like to um, say that Teflon is the devil. Uh, you know, and, and, and I'm sure you've seen the new movie with Mark Ruffalo, you know, Dark Waters, and you know, it even adds more fuel to that fire, which, um, you know, is tremendous. And, and cook culture, we've gone to some pretty great lengths to try to eliminate Teflon from the environment. And actually, we, we pay people to take it back on specific discount programs that we have throughout the year um, yeah. that are really, really successful. And we really, really enjoy it. But, you know, is it you know, a mountain of, out of a molehill? Like, what's your opinion around, you know, Teflon and the reason for getting rid of it and should it, should be, or does it matter? Like, where are you on that? We need to get rid of it. <laughs> it's terrible stuff. I mean, I don't know what else you need to see. Like, the, 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 the DuPont chemical thing is, is extremely, I don't know, cut, that's pretty cut and dry to me. Um, mm -hmm. that, that this, this doesn't really belong in our food system. Um, um, among other things, uh, which is, it's all part of that movement of, of like, you know, how, how, you know, how our food and our food choices and our product choices really, um, really have a, an impact on, on our surroundings, on our environment, on our own health. And, uh, yeah, and Teflon is, is right up there, you know, at the top. I mean, you got like, as, as one of the things that you can do pretty easily and, uh, and vote with your dollar to, to get out of that, you know, get out of that cycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, it's hard not to uh, disagree with you, you know, but for somebody who's on the fence, um, you know, who's like, you know, I've got the pans, they, they don't seem bad. You know, like what, what do you say if you have friends that are questioning you about it, like, right from what, what do you say to somebody who, who um, is, is having a hard time coming from one side to the other, right? Like, like, is there, is there a, um, a point that you can make to people that usually allow them to see how Teflon does it shouldn't be working in our environment? Uh, I don't know. It's, it's like smoking cigarettes, you know, tell them that it's bad for you. And <laughs> great analogy. You know, I just, I, I don't, I, I'm not one to, um, I don't know, is proselytize the right word? I, I guess, I guess I would, um, rather than showing them how bad they are for using Teflon, I would tr show them how much I care about them as a person and their health. And I'm looking out for them and I, and I want them to be, I want them to be healthy. I want them to eat good food and I want them to, um, you know, participate in a, in a, world where we don't um you know throw stuff away just because it doesn't work anymore um and uh that's that's i, I kind of go more toward that angle personally yeah, yeah. Uh, despite my own beliefs of like get out get that out of there <laughs> right do you think there's a, a a way for us to better incentivize people you know like our our program that we do is that we in September, we offer 30% off of the cost of a pan uh, with the support of, of vendors. And we, but you have to bring us a pan for a pan. You have to bring us a Teflon pan and then we'll sell you a new pan at a heavy discount. Like, you know, and, and that seems to work. We get around a ton of pans each time we do that um, uh, over a six week period. That's awesome. It's, it's fantastic. It blows my mind every time <laughs> we, know, we got truckloads, like regular vehicle truckloads off to the recycler. And we found yeah. a recycler that actually removes the surface and can separate the materials and they deal yeah. with the sur surface as a, as, a as a toxic material. Um, yeah. They remove the handles the whole bit, um, which is awesome. And they're in Vancouver. Yeah. But do you see a way, like, is there a way that you, you guys have been brainstorming or a way to, to, to try to help people you know, incentivize them or get away from, from, uh, uh, Teflon. We've had the same, uh, thought as you, uh, we just don't, we, we sort of haven't figured out how to do it without a physical location. <laughs> mm. Yeah. 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 You know, cause at, at the point at which you're mailing pans all over the country, totally I'm like, uh, you know, so, um, you know, I think on a larger scale, when we when we get to that place where that's something that we are gonna, you know, I, I I guess we with where we're at and what our infrastructure is like and and what we're trying to do with our company and how we're trying to kind of keep growing and surviving and keep with a pretty small team, um, you know, planting big flags like that in the ground is sort of something that's completely on our radar, but. Uh, it's a little difficult, like, you know, because where, again, where are we going to send those pans? Are we going to ship pans to these people? Um, and so I think, uh, I think we're for, for now we're, we're sort of like a lead by example type uh, feeling on things um, mm -hmm. and uh, kind of keep going and, uh, and keep adding those layers as we, as we can. Uh, but yeah. Totally supportive of your of that initiative, and uh, really glad to hear that it's so successful for you guys. Um, you know, kind of gives us gives us a little bit of um, uh, it gives us a data point uh, as to what kind of the effectiveness could be for something like that. Yeah, no, it's it's been it's been a, amazing and surprising. It's taken time. Um, you know, we as a retailer in two thousand and fourteen, I started to really do more to eliminate what we were doing. And then in 2016, uh, when the article in the New York Times came out that is based on the movie Dark Waters that just came out this year with Mark Ruffalo, um, that's where I just went all in. You know, we eliminated all Teflon. We don't even sell waffle iron anymore because I can't find one that 
doesn't have a Teflon or Teflon like nonstick. Um, bakeware, yeah. everything with a chemical type nonstick went out the door. And, you know, to be straight with you, it cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in sales annually because we really didn't have a direct replacement because there is no direct replacement. You know, the ceramic coated cookwares were supposed to be that direct replacement and they've ended up being a complete disaster, uh, environmental disaster, because they become garbage very quickly. Uh, I haven't found one ceramic coated cookware that lasts long, you know, any longer than a couple of years at most. And so our only real path forward was cast iron and carbon steel. And it's been a very slow build, you know, where we eliminated quite drastically hundreds of thousands of dollars of sales, um, you know, within a, a fairly quick timeline. And those now have been added back, fortunately, but it's taken years of, of you know, education and growth in one pan after one pan. Um, so for a lot of retailers, you know, that's, you know, to who's not really emotionally committed, that's a, that's a big hit, who are depending on $5,000, $10,000, $100,000 of nonstick cookware every year. Yeah. Right? And, and, I, and I get that, right? So it, and it's a hard thing, especially when, when the science seems so muddied by the big major players. Yeah. Yeah. Right? You know. The, uh, I mean, yeah, I know. It's just, uh, it's just one of those big, big, hurdles of um 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 you know how to run your own businesses so, you know, work with your own ideals that you try to do try to do what's right for your your customers and the planet and your values system you know yeah. so um, what would you say to a you know a retailer who's selling cookware and trying to make it work and you know there's this Hey, you know, we have field and we have this initiative. We want you to, you know, do this initiative buyback. But, you know, part of the condition is that, you know, you get rid of selling Teflon and, you know, what, what would you be able to say to a retailer? And I ask you this out of, you know, I, you may not have a good answer for this because I don't really, but I, I look at other retailers that are one foot in and one foot out. Um, you know, and from a, from a business perspective, from a guy who makes money, you know, selling pans that aren't Teflon, um, you know, what, what would you say to them? From a business perspective, yeah, I would, I would ask them what they're, you know, what, what are they in it for? If, uh, if, if you have a sense of, um, a higher purpose to what you're doing, and you got to look at what those values are that you're putting behind it and, and you know ask yourself whether you're fulfilling that or not because at the end of the day that's that's the thing that gives you satisfaction out of your life not you know the if you if you do something that you know is wrong <laughs> because it helps you in some other category i don't think you end up i don't think that's really a great trade off so right um, so you blood money is basically what you're saying yeah basically <laughs> <laughs> yeah fair I, I i my my words have become harsher over the last several years because i have you know friends of mine in industry that that i see at trade shows and that sort of thing and you know when we go to iha in chicago each year we didn't go this year of course um you know it's it's teflon city right you know cookware is still it's dominated by the big major brands um that are are teflon coated everything yeah Right. You know, and it, you really don't see, you know, you're going to see a little bit now of Finex at, uh, at somewhere like IHA. And just to put it in perspective, IHA is our large um, International Housewares Association show that we all go to in Chicago every year. And it's massive. Um, but Finex was bought by Lodge um, this year. And so we'll probably start seeing them at those shows, but that's the, and, and Lodge is always there and Lodge has a huge big booth at, uh, at this trade show, but they are, you know, one of only. Uh, a, a few, you know, and you mostly, you know, all the big manufacturers are there and it's just Teflon, 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 Teflon everywhere. As far as you can see. Yeah. I, I actually went uh, a couple of years ago and cause I was like, Oh, I guess we need to do this. And then I went and I was like, Oh my God. That's not where you need to be. I couldn't believe how many rows of crappy pans I whacked by. I'm like, geez, how, why is, how do you even differentiate? Or like, Oh yeah. Trying but I don't, there's no difference all made in the same factory in china 
very yeah. much. Yeah, over and over and over again, right? You know, and, and, and then you got even the higher quality brands like, you know, Allclad, who is, you know, proposing that they're making a high quality product. They're then coding their, what should be lifelong coder product in, in Teflon. You know, and I've seen, I've seen $200 Allclad pans that have become garbage in six months because they're coded. Yeah. Got to hold these companies to a higher standard. True. Yeah, very much. They're yeah. just they're just reacting to what people say they want, you know. Yep. Constantly. So it's kind of a terrible feedback loop. <laughs> it is. I agree. <laughs> um, well, hopefully, a little bit by a little bit, we can make a change. So I I, I really do appreciate all your time, and this yeah. has been you know it's interesting. You know, I, I I really hope to get some some little bits. I don't have that that answer, that complete answer of why this is the best pen that I've ever used. Like, I'm not sure exactly why it could be the emotional attachment I have to it. The journey that I've been on with you from the beginning uh, has been really fantastic. I've really enjoyed it. You know, being involved in the Kickstarter campaign and following along and seeing you guys get up and going and more information coming has been a lot of fun. So I do recommend people to go back to the, the beginning and take a look at that. Um, but it, it, it is just stunning how incredibly well it, it, it works. So I, you know, it, it, even, even if I don't have that, technical answer of exactly why your surface is so much better than others or not I mean, so much better is probably a little bit harsh it is that much better that i really noticed the difference um you know and i you know enameled cast iron cookware uh, carbon steel other brands of high quality cast you know they they all work incredibly well but yours just seems to have that edge that makes me so happy Glad to hear it, and I uh, hope you can lean into a little bit of that um, magical, mystical feel uh, after this, because I think that is literally the only element that you're probably missing at this point. It's just a little bit of, a little bit of belief in, uh, uh, you know, just that goodness behind it. Yeah, yeah. I guess I'm always looking for that technical aspect because I, you know, when I'm sitting there talking to a customer in store, and I'm like, oh, you just got to believe it's magical. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, it's a two hundred and fifty dollar pan, and you just gotta yeah. be mad, believe in the magic. But you know, it, people are though, and that's what's fantastic. People are coming in; they're 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 buying. Like I said, they're coming in cold. You know, they may know of our brand in the marketplace, but they may not be a customer. And they come in, and they're buying. They could easily buy a a fifty dollar Modge ten inch pan, or they're yeah. buying a two hundred dollar Canadian pan, and they're buying that over and over, and they're so incredibly happy. You know, they buy a, a, a chainmail scrubby mm -hmm. and they're, they're super happy. So the return positiveness that we're getting from field pans is just amazing, right? So it's, it's such a feel good product to sell for us. So we're, we're extraordinarily ecstatic to be uh, a partner of yours and we thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us and uh, you're doing a great job uh, <laughs> getting us out there and telling our stories and, and uh, I'm glad you're a fan, feels cool. good. Awesome. Well, I look forward to the new product and uh, I look forward to talking to you again really soon. Yeah, same job. Nice awesome. uh, chat with you. Thanks, you. All right, man. Take care. Thank you. Mm -hmm.